So today we're going to be talking about the nice guy. And why, why do women just not like nice guys? Why do women absolutely detest nice guys? The answer is going to be kind of surprising. We're going to talk about that this week on Relaxed Mail. Hello and welcome to Relaxed Mail, a podcast that helps men change their relationship with themselves. I am your host, Brian, and I am a men's life and mindset coach who is here to help you understand that you don't have to suffer at your own expense. You can live your dream, and I encourage you to set, then pursue your goals. So join me as I change the mindset and attitudes of men so that they can be the leaders of their families and their destinies. Hey man, hello and welcome to Relax Mail. All right, so this week we're talking about the nice guy. We're talking and more specifically why nice guys fail and that the reason why they fail so much in all their endeavors. Why do they always finish last? Because women can't stand a nice guy. Now there are some who are some women whose personalities are a little more complimentary to the nice guy. They're the women who want to take control of everything, and the nice guy just kind of goes along with for for the ride. But eventually. Even that type of woman really gets absolutely fed up with the actions of a nice guy. And so why do nice guys get such a bad rap? Well, essentially because they're liars. They are inherently lying to anybody and everybody who will listen, whether they realize they uh, lie, or they're lying about it or they don't. A lot of times nice guys will just be the most upfront about how honest they are. They will profess from the highest mountain that they are the most honest person that they, you will ever come across. And because of that, a lot of times they don't even see the lies that they're actually telling everybody about what they think, what they, how they feel and things like that. They don't share their feelings they or anything uh, or their thoughts or anything like that. So nice guys really deep down, all they are just manipulators and they're just the, the biggest, not well, the biggest douchebags you ever come across. And this is coming from someone who is a recovering nice guy. So I know kind of, I have a good idea of what I'm talking about here. So anyhow, I start really kind of got into the, the deeper into the topic of the nice guy, because I recently listened to, um, re-listened to the, uh, the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. And the Fountainhead is a really interesting story in because you really get to know the main characters. You really get to know who Howard Rourke is and Dominique Francone and, and Guy Francone and, and Peter Keating and the, the rest of the people who are involved in this story that takes place back in the, uh, like in the twenties and thirties. As, uh, is from what I've kind of gathered because it's, they talk about the, the great depression that happens and how, uh, build the building trade doesn't happen. But anyhow, the, the, the story in a, as a whole is about individuals and individualism and the power of the single man who, and the single will to get stuff done as opposed to the, as opposed to the power of the collective, because when you let the collective come in, all the great ideas get watered down and mushed down and it just becomes very bland. And they talk about this, uh, in the, essentially it's their version of the world's fair. They're supposed to be the, uh, architecture through the ages, big exhibit. And because of this big exhibit, they took eight, the eight greatest, uh, uh, architects in the, in the world and, they were all supposed to get together and supposed to make this new wonderful thing. And it basically looked, was a disaster. It was an absolute total disaster because no one idea shined through. Howard Rourke was a different guy. He was, he was said he would love to do the, uh, architecture through the ages exhibit, but he had to be the one who did it. And he was what they like to call a modernist. He was basically Frank Lloyd Wright. And, through the story from the very beginning to, to the end, you see the, this one character, his name is Peter Keating. Howard Rourke lives with, uh, Peter Keating because they're, they are, live in a college town. Uh, 
Howard Rourke is renting a room from uh, from Peter Keating's mom, and Peter Keating becomes this kind of kind of celebrity uh, in his own mind. He is able to he he is the nice guy, and so you see this nice guy who is saying everything that he can. He it, uh, he gets in the job with Frank Cohn and Hire, and in this, as he works with, uh, through the company, he ends up manipulating those around him. He manipulates one guy out of his own, uh, out of his own job. And the guy becomes, uh, a, uh, dipsomaniac and, and, uh, ends up fading off into, into history, becoming just a very se- second rate draftsman. And from there, he takes, uh, the head draftsman's position by finding him a, a, job to a uh, uh, he's been wanting to get out of the head uh, draftsman uh, or the head architect is wanting to get out of out of working for Frank Cohn and hire this uh, architect firm and wants to become a uh, kind of venture out on his own and Peter Keating helps him do that and he's the whole time Peter Keating is always making these comments and is very flamboyant and very likable and everybody there likes him and he's he's just this all-around great guy and he easily buddies up to uh to the the boss uh guy francone and becomes his best friend he buddies up to uh uh lucius hire and get so much it buddies up to him at a at a critical time to where even lucius hire gives him wills everything to him uh, uh everything in his estate the partnership shares and all that for uh, Frank Cohn and Hire. But as the story progresses, you see that this mighty rocket of, that is known as Peter Keating goes higher and higher, not, you know, up and up and up until to a certain point. And because he's getting help from other, pre- other people now, it kind of turns out that this person is uh, Peter Keating is being used to prove a point, but it gets to a certain point and because he is not able to influence anybody else, he got to the, to a certain pinnacle and he slowly starts to fall down. All of a sudden the glory is not there and he's unhappy and he's trying to figure out what it is. And he, at one time he used to love to paint and draw and his mom told him, no, you really don't want to do that. You might want to do something that's more gl- glamorous and glorious and go into architecture. And he finally turns back and he starts to just paint and you, and he kind of talks about how sad it was that he was going back to, he was renting this little shack out in a, uh, out of town so that he could just sit in there and he could paint and he felt peace when he was painting. He was doing something for himself and he found that happiness when he was doing something strictly for himself. But every time he got out and started trying to, be amongst the uh the the crowd and be amongst the 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 in, uh the influential people again he was just he would found himself to be more and more and more miserable and so this whole story i mean uh, the whole way through you just see and hear nice guy because he's doing everything he's making everybody happy he's doing everything but he doesn't have he's he's a second rate architect because he only Maybe some people even call him a third rate architect because he doesn't actually have any of his own ideas. He won't let his own ideas shine through. He, unlike Howard Rourke, who he starts off with a really rough start because he's doing something. He's got his own ideas, his own set of morals, and it's all about what he knows he wants to do. He's not about to compromise any of his thoughts, any of his integrity. So he doesn't build unless he has able to build what he wants to do. And because Howard Rourke is, does this, yeah, he kind of starts off and people kind of notice him. And there's a couple of uh, buildings that he gets to build, but then eventually they die off and boom, voila, he disappears and he goes off and he ends up, uh, going to, uh, going to work in a, in a granite quarry for a while. He's, he doesn't have the pride of going, well, I am an architect and I'm only going to be a, he has no pride in that, but he knows what he is meant to do, what he is about able to do. And so he held off and he knew he had to just do, you know, go to the grindstone and do what he had to do without allowing the world to have access to his, to his thoughts. 
he held on to his thoughts until the world was ready. And once the world was ready, he started to really build. Now, there was a point where he got, you know, he got it got flim flammed. If you want to use one of those weird words, he got he got talked into doing a doing a, a, a temple. And it was because the antagonist of the uh, of the book had talked a guy into just letting um into using Howard Rourke, knowing perfectly well that Howard Rourke's uh, temple style was not going to meet up with what the uh, what this one particular guy wanted to have. And so, with that, Howard Rourke's after that little dip, Howard Rourke starts to take off again. And because of that, because Howard Rourke was able to stick with himself, stick with what his ideas were, with his, and stick with his convictions, he was able to continue to go up and continue even through the. Through like the the depression, while Peter Keating's business, which was this huge multi story uh, uh, architecture firm, at the, one of the last scenes you see that the upper uh, story has been closed off, and it's just the a, just a couple of small rooms that are left because Peter Keating didn't have any ideas, didn't want to share his ideas, didn't want his ideas to get out because Peter Keating was the nice guy. Now, I tell you all of this. Because then the next book I ended up reading was <laughs> No More Mr. Nice Guy, and everything clicked. I mean, there was an audible, oh, hey, there you go. And I started to see all these. And one of the things that I noticed, and I came across a guy who was making a comment about, I'm, uh, he was making a comment about how, he, why is it that so many nice guys don't get what they want? Why is it that nice guys never, uh, always finish last? And the honest reason is because this is a divorce, uh, uh, divorce forum that I was looking at. It's because women detest the nice guy. Peter Keating found that he ended up getting the beautiful woman for a little while, but she was, she only married him strictly so that she could punish herself because she was not going to give him ideas. He had to come up with his own ideas and his own thoughts himself. And because uh, she wasn't about to help him think he was incredibly miserable around her because he couldn't be himself. So nice guys can't, they don't, there's so many problems that nice guys have. And the Robert Glover, the, the author of no more master nice guy states uh, very nicely, just about everything a nice guy does is consciously or unconsciously calculated to gain someone's approval or to avoid disapproval. Nice guys are liars. They are cheats. They are manipulators. And that's, they use those tactics to, to ensure that they get people to react to them in a favorable, positive fashion. Um, they use things like covert contracts and they lie to others and themselves. They don't share ideas and they try to control all aspects of a situation. They want to control what, how people react to them and they cause their own misery because they don't allow people to be, the, to be themselves. They want to control that person. They want you to be happy. You need to be happy all the time. Well, what if you're not happy to a, to a nice guy? You can't be unhappy because if you're unhappy, they don't know what to do with themselves. There is so much emotional turmoil that goes on and anxiety that goes on when somebody is just, you know, not happy for whatever reason. Maybe they're just kind of there, but they're not laughing and giggling and they're just kind of there. It really bothers a nice guy. So they nice guys have to find a way to manipulate the person instead of just letting that person be where they're at, let them give them the space so that they can work through whatever that problem is. Give them the ability. No guys, nice guys rush in head first and they're, Oh, we're going to get this fixed right now. And they, you know, they'll do stuff. They'll try to make, make them somebody who is crying, laugh, you know, do whatever they can to get so that they don't feel the, the turmoil of, Oh my gosh, this person's not happy around me. Why is this person not happy around me? They, they care. They don't care about me. They're, you know, it's all these fears of abandonment and, and emotional, um, turmoil that kicks up when somebody isn't feeling the way that a, a nice guy wants them to feel. Now, not another word for a nice guy is a people pleaser. People pleasers. You've heard me mention people pleasers before. But I've gotten around to where I've really started focusing in on just the, the, the whole angle of a nice guy because it's, 
that's the guy version of a of a of a people pleaser. Uh, yeah, there are nice girls. There are people pleaser women out there, and they do. They're just as bad. They have all the same aspects, and they're just as miserable. But one of the big ones, like I said, is nice guys can't handle emotions. When it comes to handling emotions, it is just an anxiety riddled mess. They, anything extreme, someone gets angry and is stomping around and is upset. Well, they're going to run over there and they're going to try to calm them down. And they're all about, you know, oh my, well, you, okay, no, I know it's, it, it, he's horrible. And then they may turn around and talk to the other person and go, yeah, yeah, I know the guy's a jerk. They're going to lie to each other. They're going to try to manipulate the situation because they have to have that type of control. It's got to be controlled because if there's, if they're not in control, then who knows what type of emotions may erupt and what are they going to do with all those emotions? They don't know how to handle those emotions. And oh my gosh. And that's the type of thing that, that scares a nice guy to death. And because of that, they do. They lie as much as they can. They will lie and sell their mother up the river if it means that people will like them. They will, if it's, and it's the, the, the problem that they run into is, they're, they don't know that they don't know why they always finish last because they make everybody happy. And that's the reason why they always finish last is because they always make people happy. They have to have people in their control. They have to be manipulating stuff. And because they can't take control, that's one thing that women really look to on, in a guy is a man who can lead them as a family. And so when a nice guy is in a relationship, the woman ends up taking up the, the, the leadership reins. And like I said, there are some women there who won't have, who take, take pride in the fact that they're, they're going to do that. But at the same time, eventually they get really freaking tired of, of playing mama to, to a grown ass man. They get tired of it. And so they're going to start, you know, they start resenting that guy who is always tugging at their, sh- at their skirt hems going, Honey, can I have sex? Can I have sex? Can I have sex? Can I, can I go out outside? Can I go ride the bike? Can I go walk? You know, and they're always asking because they're not going to take control of their own life. They're not going to take control of anything if they can avoid it because you know what? People may not like the fact that they don't like that. Or maybe they want to go for a walk and you know, maybe the wife had, had other plans. Well, I don't want to make her mad. She, if I can make her mad, she's not going to have sex with me. Well, you know what? She's not having sex with you already. And yeah, I'm talking about sex a lot with that because that's the main thing guys, nice guys want. They want to have that physical interaction, that, that, uh, physical response. But at the same time, they are scared to death of that physical response because that physical response is a lot of emotion. So a lot of nice guys, they suffer from, uh, you know, uh, from having a, uh, uh, ED, they also, uh, premature ejaculation, these types of things they suffer from a lot. And yet they all of a sudden get a chance to be with their, their girl and, you know, they've got limp noodle because they, all of a sudden there is a lot of commitment, and a lot of emotion that is focused in on the act of sex. Nice guys also tend to be very closed off. Also, they don't want to share their emotions because their emotions may affect other people and how, and those people's, uh, how they respond. They can't control how that person's going to respond. So they're not going to share that emotion. They're not going to share their thoughts, their ideas or anything like that. Uh, nice guys are very closed off. They want to put up a very good facade of, Hey, I am this, you know, I'm this round rousing, great, awesome dude. But, you know, they're not going to really provide a very good partner because they're, you know, they're, they're not there emotionally. They're not uh, committed to a person in that emotional way. So women end up having to be the leaders. And because the women are the leaders, the guys, the, the nice guys always asking their wives, for decisions, you've seen the classic. Hey, so where do you want to go eat? Uh, I don't know. Where do you want to go eat? Uh, I don't care. Where do you like to eat? Uh, I don't know. Where do you want? A, ni- a nice guy is going, not going to make the decision because that decision scares the booger out of him. So he is going to hound his girlfriend or his wife until she makes a decision, but she is screaming almost for that nice guy to say, just gross, uh, uh, just grow some balls for just a short minute, man. So you can make a decision. So I don't have to, I'm giving you the reins. I want you to be the boss for just a a split second. Where do we want to go? You choose. 
And that's all that the girl's saying in that. If she says, I don't, oh, I don't care, then do choose. Now, there's some little sneaky ways, you know, make how some people will go, uh, have said, well, give out three decisions, um, and have her try to guess where we're going. And that's where you go. Okay. That's one thing you could do because you're making the decision. You're choosing, you know, uh, the Mexican food, the Chinese food or the Indian food place. And all re- in all reality, you would really like to go to the steakhouse. Well, she says, I don't know. I, I, I don't care. Okay. Well, then decide. You can either make those decisions or just go ahead and go, you know what? Okay. Well, we're, we're going to the steakhouse then. And so y'all go to Al's steakhouse and y'all enjoy a great steak. And she enjoys the fact that you made a choice. And, and when you, a nice guy does that and takes a, takes up the, the reins and actually leads the family and doesn't, worry about everybody else's emotions so darn much that's when all of a sudden the wife kind of starts peeking up and going oh well hell, maybe maybe there is a little bit of man in in him still he's maybe he's growing up maybe he's not that little boy because nothing is less sexy to a woman than a grown boy all right somebody she's got to take care of oh gosh she doesn't care to have that in her in that person you know rooting around in her crotch. So nice guys, because they can't be open, they can't be honest. They will tell somebody one thing, turn right around and tell the other person the next. Nice guys are always liars. They are some of the biggest liars you'll ever come across. To Again, take it from one of the biggest nice guys there was around here. That's your t- and that was me. I was nice guy of nice guys until I realized <laughs> I'm causing my own misery. I'm causing my own suffering until I started making my, until producing my own thoughts and holding my own thoughts, voicing my own thoughts. And now my wife kind of gets a little, she's like, you always got to argue about everything. Well, yeah, it's kind of actually kind of fun to share your own particular thoughts and ideas. My ideas don't match up to anybody else in particular because I have my own thoughts. I've taken what I've seen around me and I meld meld them into what I think is the truth. And I hand that out. One reason why women are detest the nice guy so much is, well, they give up their balls. They have no balls. They've taken them, whipped them off. Handed them to the to the woman in their life and said, "Here you go. You hold on to these for me." They won't make any decisions, and because they won't make any decisions, they there's no nothing for uh, a woman to do other than to start getting aggravated, and she's going to treat him in and badly, and she may because she's not respecting him. And when you are being the nice guy, you are not getting any respect. You do not develop any respect because of your victim mindset. Because you don't have your own thoughts. So you're not going to get any respect. Men also, nice guys also go off and seek the approval of women over the approval of men. Now, it may sound a little weird, especially if you are a, a, a nice guy. It's like, well, yeah, well, I, you want to get the approval of women. Why, why do you want the approval of men? Because men actually are the anti, uh, the, the antidote to the nice guy syndrome. If you want to get out of being a a nice guy and you really want to figure out how to get out of being a nice guy, start spending as much time as possible with a group of guys. They are going to change how you think, how you act, how you, how you talk. They're going to change how you, how you interact with everybody. And you will start to be able to start voicing your own thoughts. And it's going to be scary that first time because you never, if you're a nice guy, you've never developed the skill of hanging around a bunch of dudes. You've always been used to hanging out with a bunch of women. I know this because I, whenever I go down to, uh, down to central Texas and I hang out with my, uh, with my family, who am I hanging out with? I'm hanging out with my aunt, my, and my mom and some of mom's friends and some other family members. And they're all majority women. I had my grandfather and my uncle and I would barely see them. Why? Because I was trying to seek the approval of women over men. This next time I go to Pottsville, guess what I'm going to be doing? I am probably going to be spending maybe a good about half the time with the men of the of, of our the uh, where we, our family lives, and going to be hanging out with them a lot more, spending more time with the men and getting to know them, getting to talking with them, and getting to understand and know them better, because that is what men do. Men hang around with men. 
Women hang around with women. Yeah, we intermix from time to time. When it's supper time, we all sit together and we all talk and yada, yada, yada. And they come over and I talk with mom for a bit. And mom may come over and talk with Arthur for a bit. And it, wife may come over and talk with me and Arthur. And I may go over and, and talk with uh, with some some other uncle or some of the other cousins and stuff like that. That's what guys do. But because men, nice guys seek the approval of women over men, they avoid the masculinity. They don't, masculinity to them is really nerve wracking because men are loud, rambunctious. They don't, are, they're not always gentle with their words. They, men call it as they see it. This is, can be an insanely scary thing to a nice guy because they can't control that environment. All of a sudden you got all these guys who are, you know, all bumping the chest against each other. You know, it's all men, 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 men type of stuff. And because they are all bouncing off of each other and it's just all full, of, you know, you get that stale uh, corn chip smell of testosterone going, you know, that's really unnerving to a nice guy. Because, again, they can't control what these other guys are doing. He tries to control them. A lot of times they're going to go, you're an idiot. Who cares? Why are you worried about it? Buzz off. You know, they're, they're going to tell them what they think. A man's actions and words are very intimidating to a nice guy. So they're going to avoid the men, which, like I said before, it's to their detriment. They need to have a interaction with a group of men to be able to thin out that whole nice guy line of thinking. So they need their need their masculinity, need to have guys around them to uh, provide the masculinity so that they can actually regain ownership of, of their testicles. And until they actually get those testicles back, they're really still going to be hanging on to mama's skirt or hanging on to their wife's skirt, trying to see what they can do to try to hopefully get them to do uh, to find the right thing. That will allow their wife, that will compel their wife, actually is what it is, They to convince their wife that they should have sex with them. Because they have a lack of meaningful relationships with men, they also sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. They blame others, and especially their wives and girlfriends, when they don't get the sex that they want. And the reason why they don't get the sex they want is because of the actions that they do. They are always, re they're resentful for women. Because they do want to have sex with them. But because the man often self-sabotages the, the attempt, the actions, the, the efforts to be able to have sex, the woman eventually gets tired, fed up with it. It's like, why even try? This is, it's not even worth the headache of trying to get undressed just so that I can lay down and have this guy on top of me for five minutes. It's not worth it. So we, us nice guys will often come up with thoughts like she doesn't like sex or she's just a bitch or, you know, we'll come up with these, all these different excuses that we tell ourselves and we'll look for the meaning. I mean, I, for the longest time, I had the firm belief that women only like sex three different times in their life. That's when they are looking for a man, when they want children and when they want to make sure that they keep the man around. And in all, all reality, no, that's not true. But I haven't been the man beforehand who was the type of guy that my wife wanted to sleep with. And those are things that are actually in the works of being changed. You know, the guys will wander around and, and whine about uh, how they try to help around the house. And, and all the wife does is gripe about how you did the work. Why did you put the, put the bowls on the top rack? They go on the bottom rack. Well... Because you're not going to take action. She can sit there and say that. But if you're like, well, because that's how I want to put the bowls in. And be okay with stating that fact and stating it and letting it just hang there. You actually are giving yourself a, a bit of a boundary. Nice guys don't set boundaries. R men actually do. You know, guys will do stuff like uh, do things like covert contracts. Those are... When I do something, I'm expecting this in return. The only problem is, you know, I if I sweep the house, I expect maybe a handy later on that night. Did you ever bother to tell your wife that that's what you were going to do? No, no, we don't ask. We don't don't t tell. We don't bother with that because we might get the uh, get a response we don't want to have. And then when we don't get what we what our covert contract said we were wanting to have, then we blame them. 
when in all reality, it's the nice guy's fault because he didn't even bother telling the other person that there was a contract in play. Those covert contracts are huge and big killers. And that's one reason why I believe in the 100 zero, uh, marriage principle where you give a hundred percent and you expect zero in return. Doesn't always happen. There's a lot of times where you still want to expect stuff in return. But if you try to keep that principle and go in play, you make life a lot easier and you give the wife uh, the ability to provide her one, give 100 and expect zero in return. And we actually are able to fulfill each other's needs. So wrapping this up, man, if you want to start having a better life, better marriage, maybe your marriage is on the rocks. It's falling apart. It's coming to pieces. Start with reading no more Mr. Nice Guy by Robert Glover. Um, it is not going to give you all the answers, but he has a lot of work uh, sheets that are in there that will help you to understand and start to work your way through the whole nice guy syndrome is how he likes to call it. And it allows you to finally get around to starting to express your thoughts, express your ideas, start canceling out those covert contracts and say, you know, go up to your wife. He's like, Hey, I know you're a little tired, a little, uh, a little wore out from uh, the kids yesterday. I've got the kids taken care of today. We're going to go out. We're going to go do this. Let her know what you're doing and then go do it. And because you have allowed your wife some time to, to herself, you might even mention, it's like, and when I get back and we put the kids to bed, maybe you and I can, you know, do a little snuggling up later on, you know, and it might even be more, even more forthcoming than that. But, you know, little baby steps, you know, you might have to start off with, well, I'm only comfortable with saying we're going to snuggle up tonight instead of, you know, and after that, maybe we can both get naked and, you know, have all sorts of fun. You know, you can get to the point. You can start working yourself up to the point to where you're actually venting or not venting, but expressing what your thoughts are. Take the time to stop being the nice guy. Your life is miserable because of you. Are there problems that caught? Where did these these thoughts and this nice guy come from? Well, it's stuff that might it may have happened in the past. It may have been um, wrong actions. Um, it, that, uh, that were reinforced over and over and over again through the early parts of the marriage. But either way, things can change. Things can become better. You can start to actually have more sex with that woman that you absolutely deeply love. Or then again, maybe you get, you two finally get together and you'll start, you finally become, start vo voicing your thoughts and all that. And you realize he, she's really not what I want. And, so you start to become okay with the idea of, well, let's, let's end this marriage. It's not good. It's not good for either one of us. Let's go our separate ways and let's live our, live a life in a more truer fashion. When you become a man and not a nice guy, you're okay with those decisions. You're, it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt. It doesn't mean that it's, you're not going to have the emotional turmoils that come about with it, but you're okay with those emotions as they come up. You're going to address those emotions as they come up. You can handle it. becomes your motto. So, guys, I believe that you can handle it. And if you, I want to thank you again for uh, listening. And if you would, please, if you've gone made it this far, then go ahead and share this episode out. Share it with uh, other guys that you know of. Maybe you know a couple other guys who really fit the the demographics of what a nice guy is. And let them hear let them hear what a nice guy is and how they their actions may be actually might be kind of the might be the source of the problem share this out with your friends your family your the guys in your social media groups and uh, on twitter and getter and parlor and instagram and all the other social media uh, channels that you may have we'll grow this group so that we and start get, developing this community so we actually have a bunch of men who are able to help each other quit being the nice guy, quit being the, 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 the nutless wonder and become the great, honorable, noble men because we need more noble men in the world this, this way. And the only way we can get there is to start getting our guys gathered together and start helping each other out and helping us become the, the powerful men that our society needs. 
So guys, with that, I thank you. You can go to, uh, if you want to subscribe, go to relaxedmail.com forward slash subscribe. I've got a list of all the different uh, apps out there that you can subscribe to. If you are interested in uh, leaving a rating and review, you can go to uh, relaxmail.com forward slash Android or relaxmail, uh, relax, uh, relaxmail forward slash uh, Apple for the Apple uh, podcast. Or you can go to relaxmail.com forward slash Google to the Google podcast. Or you can go to relaxmail.com forward slash podchaser to the podchaser uh, page. That way you can leave a rating review and we can get a little bit of social credit built for people that uh, are looking for more shows like this. So, guys, thank you again. Y'all have a wonderful week. Talk to you next time.